O ayan, isang napakagandang hapon po sa ating lahat at malugod na pagbati mula sa Future Earth Philippines. Welcome po sa ika-85 episode ng ating lingguhang usapan na talakayan, ang The Filipino SDG Action Hour. Muli nyo kaming samahan sa isa't kalahating oras ng exciting at makabuluhang talakayan tungkol sa mga paksa na napapanahon at tiyak na kapupulutan ng aral at narunungan. At alam niyo po ba sa hapon na ito, pag-uusapan natin ang climate types and climate change in the Philippines. So, nung nalaman ko po yung title nito, unang pumasok sa utak ko, ito ba ay kapareho o iba sa kasalukuyang Corona's Climate, uh, climate Classification na ginagamit natin? Uh, ano rin ba ang kalagahan nito uh, sa ating, atin na malaman? Ano ang relasyon nito sa ating kabuhayan, kapaligiran, at sa kapasidad nating mga, na matugunan ang kahandaan natin sa National Disaster Management? dulot ng pabago-bagong panahon. Um, isa pang tanong sa akin na pumasok, may epekto ba ito sa sektor ng agrikultura at sa food security in general? Ito yung ilan sa mga exciting na katanungan na masaya nating tatalakay sa hapon na ito sa tulong ng ating bigating panauhin. Siya po ang kasalukuyang Senior Scientist Emeritus ng Goddard Space Flight Center and NASA. Nasa po yan, ha? Ang laki. Nagsimula kanyang career sa pag-aaral tungkol sa climate change sa NASA uh, since 1979. He was instrumental on a global project observing the planet for rapid declining uh, perennial sea ice cover and produced a paper on the subject that has been cited over thousands of times. Ang ating po panauhin um has rebuilt o pinakita po niya yung extraordinary rate at napakabilis na rate in which yung pong yelo po sa Arctic ay naapektuhan po ng global warming. Approximately po sa kanya pong uh, pag-aaral, three times na mas mabilis kumpara po sa global average. Pero alam niyo po, bago po nakamit ng ating panauhin itong fibutal at career of a lifetime, siya po ay nakapagtapos ng BS in Physics sa Universidad ng Pilipinas. At yung po naman kanyang master's degree in physics ay sa Florida State University and went on to University of California, Los Angeles to earn his PhD in 1972. Ang ating pong panauhin served the university as an assistant research physicist transitioning to the University of Virginia in 1973 and to the computer sciences Corporation in Maryland during the late 70s. He accepted a position at NASA in 1979. Baliban po sa kanyang achievements sa surface temperature, uh, pag-track po ng sea ice distribution and observation of phytoplankton blooms doon po sa polar regions po ng ating mundo, nakapag-author po siya at co-author po siya ng anim na libro at 20 book chapters at mahigit kumulang na 130 referred journal publications. Susmiyo po ha, 130 po yun. Hindi po yung biro. At uh, medyo nalula po ako talaga sa dami nyo noon uh, nire-research ko po siya. At hindi po pang karaniwan ang ganto at nakakahanga at nakaka-inspire na professional career. At sinabi ko nga po kanina, siya po ang Senior Scientist Emeritus ng Earth Science Division sa NASA, GSFC, at adjunct professor sa Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology sa Universidad ng Pilipinas sa Diliman at siya din po ay corresponding member ng National Academy of Science and Technology. Ngayong hapong pong to, aking pong pinakikilala ang idol natin sa araw na ito, Dr. Josefino C. Comiso. And Dr. Comiso, welcome po sa Future Earth Philippines. Yes, Thank sir. You. Pwede niya pong i-share yung inyo pong screen. Salamat sa maiging maiging introduction. I don't know whether I deserve all of that. Wala naman, sir. <laughs> Pero I'm very grateful to academician, national scientist, Luli Cruz, for inviting me to be part of this series. 
and uh, I'm very happy to be able to talk to you about the topic on climate types and climate change. Uh, Loli has been involved in uh, Future Earth. Uh, let me start this slide. And uh, <clears throat> actually, that's uh, a venture that I, I would strongly, I strongly support. And the goals of that venture is in line with uh, what I've been pursuing myself uh, throughout my career. Uh, the key issues are actually those affecting our climate and our environment. We know that uh, there's global warming, uh, due primarily to uh, the increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gases. We have pollution a lot over air, land, and water. We have deforestation, soil erosion, landslides, etc. We have wildfires that are more and more expansive and more frequent. We have drought. The areas of peace are increasing uh, uh, with time. Uh, we've been having super typhoons and extensive flooding. Uh, and then we have to worry about biodiversity and ecology, especially the loss of our virgin forests and the harmful effect of algal blooms and coral bleaching. So the first part of this talk is associated with precipitation. And precipitation is actually a key element of the climate system. It provides the means to obtain clean and uh, safe domestic water. It, uh, there, it consists of two cloud types, stratiform clouds located along the frontal layers and horizontally continuous covering a relatively broad area. And then there's the second one, cloud type two. These are primarily cumulonimbus clouds that are vertically developed and produced by convective upwelling, usually due to unstable atmospheric conditions. And also uh, there's land topography that plays a major role in cloud formation. We did uh, a quality check on available precipitation data, and uh, we found a way to enhance the data, although the data is normally already uh, a, a, a data set that uh, has been uh, quality checked by members of the scientific team of uh, NASA and, and the Japanese JAXA. So this is the paper that uh, uh, we are not published. Uh, previously, there was this paper uh, under the same authorship, published in 2021, that shows the technique that we use to produce this enhanced uh, uh, precipitation data. So why do we use uh, precipitation for climate types? And the reason for that is mainly because the difference in seasonality of precipitation in different climate uh, regions is discernible. The different climate types based on precipitation can be derived <clears throat> using a time-dependent K-means cluster analysis. The boundaries of the different climate types can be determined as long as you have available data for all over a country. And surface temperature uh, is supposed to be a big factor too, but it has not been suitable for climate type analysis because differences in temperature in different regions are only slight and not so as discernible as uh, precipitation. So the best uh, system that's available right now is what they call Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. 
and is actually a successor of a previous system called TRIM, a Tropical Rental Microwave uh, Measurement. But uh, this is more powerful, it has more channels, it has higher resolution, and it has uh, uh, two radars, one at uh, a K band at 35.5 and KU band uh, at 13.6. Uh, and these two radars make it uh, a more powerful uh, system to get as uh, the uh, parameters that's needed to really characterize uh, rent pool. So there has been a lot of typhoons in the Philippines. One of them is Hagopit. And it turned out the GPM was just launched when there was this Hagopit uh, typhoon, HUU, with progress. <clears throat> That's the typhoon itself as it is mass the Philippines. And I, as you see, it can show two dimensional characterization of the typhoon. But with this system, it can actually look at uh, three dimensional because of the two radars. And uh, that enables us to quantify the amount of rain that's expected to hit the ground and also how much flooding is going to cause. So this system uh, <clears throat> was new then, but then it was used to uh, communicate with Pagasa to warn them about the strength of this typhoon. So there was an early warning done and 1 million people were evacuated. So with the use of this system, uh, there were only two casualties. That's why it's important to use high technology, especially parental data uh, to, to make uh, to minimize the risk of disaster since the Philippines is the third most disaster prone areas in the world. <clears throat> so in this study, we look at uh, uh, what they normally call is synoptic station. These are the stations that are manned and quality controlled and follow the WMO uh, specifics uh, to, to make the characterization of brain as accurately as possible. The one in the second one is uh, the data from AGS, uh, uh, automatic uh, gas stations. And the third one is GPM IMERS. I don't know, uh, can you see the third one? Uh, so you can see the difference in cupboards. The one on the left is actually uh, a location map as well as a topographic map of the Philippines. So the darkest area are actually mountainous area. And as you see here in the synoptic data, most of those mountainous areas are not covered because they're normally accessible and it's quite expensive to put then uh, synoptic stations over there. That's why here in the mountain province, for example, there's hardly any station located. And in the mountainous area in Mindanao, you can see very few stations as well. So, this coverage was improved by the OST. We started putting together the AGS uh, system. Uh, they're not manned, but uh, they're a quality check as well. And as you see, there's a lot more coverage from the AGS. And then uh, you have the uh, satellite data. So the issue is uh, people have been saying that uh, 
synoptic station data is not consistent with satellite data. So we tried to explore that uh, problem. It turned out that uh, since synoptic data is uh, a point measurement, and they're trying to compare one by one with uh, satellite data, wherever it overlaps with synoptic data, and there's a mismatch in coverage. You have a point measurements against uh, GPM data that covers uh, several kilometers square. Uh, some are 10 by 10 kilometers, some are 25 by 25 kilometers. So over that area, it's very difficult for synoptic uh, data to represent the average that we get from satellite data. So what we did is uh, to find pixels in the satellite data that has a lot of AGS data. And that's what we compared with satellite data. And where there are a lot of uh, uh, AGS data within the footprint of satellite data, there's very good agreement. So we were encouraged by that. What we did is since uh, synoptic data is the most accurate data available, it fulfills the requirement of uh, WMO. Then we normalize the AGS data using synoptic data, I'm sorry. Uh, and then use the normalized uh, GPM data to compare with satellite data. Uh, so <clears throat> in the process, we found a normalization uh, a technique to then enhance the satellite data where there is a bias. And in fact, uh, comparing, that's normally what you get when you compare uh, ARG data with satellite data, and uh, as you see, the slope is not uh, along the red line, and there's a bias. So if you correct for that, you get something like this uh, distribution, and you improve the RMS error from 2.91 to 1.96, and uh, the correlation coefficient improved from 0.83 to 0.93. Uh, what you see on the right is an example of the matching, you know, of A ARG data with uh, satellite data. And you can see that the satellite footprint is quite a large, uh, a lot bigger than what you can get from each of these ARG measurements. <clears throat> so we compared the initial ARG data with the corrected ARG data. And uh, what you see here on the lab is a more intense rain in, in the Luzon area. And uh, maybe the uh, new data set is uh, more sensitive to the monsoons. And as you see here on the right where we use uh, climatological data, you can see that the the rain is more more intense. Sorry. Uh, in in the cyclone prone areas, the eastern Visayas. So we are more sensitive uh, to the <clears throat> to the effect of cyclones. So if you look at year-to-year -year comparison, what we get from our enhanced IMERS data, which is the GPM satellite data set, you can see that the values are uh, usually higher than that of the original uh, IMERS data. So we believe that this data set is an improvement and we use that in our analysis. So these are monthly climatology. You can see how the 
rent pool data over land changes from one month to another over a seasonal cycle. I'm sorry. I don't know why I get this one. Anyway, <clears throat> we look at uh, the seasonality of uh, the general areas of the Philippines, Se seasonality of the Luzon area, the Visayas and Mindanao. And this is what we get. The one for Luzon is what we normally observe. And that's because uh, most of the seasonality in uh, most areas of Luzon are relatively uh, uh, coherent. And therefore you have a dry season here and then it goes up to the rainy season, peaks at around August and then goes down after that. But with Visayas and Mindanao, the variability is not as much and you can see not see a strong seasonality. That's the case with Mindanao as well. And the reason for that is because Eastern Visayas has a different uh, climate type than Western Visayas. And if you take the average, then uh, you don't get a strong seasonality at all. The same is true with Mindanao as well. So what you see here on the bottom are yearly averages for Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. It's color coded. The red is uh, for Visayas, blue is for Luzon, and Mindanao is uh, in gray. And you can see the sensitivity with uh, Enso, for example. What you see are vertical uh, lines here uh, are uh, time period when there was uh, Enso or El Nino. And you can see that early on, the, the values are low associated likely with the El Ninos in uh, 2002, five, and, and six. And then uh, you can see that all of them are sensitive to the uh, El Nino in 2010, and then 2015, as well as 2019. So in terms of interannual variability, you can see it in this graph. Uh, I don't know whether you can all see it, but uh, as you see, there's uh, a lot of year-to-year -year variability. Yeah. There are some when it's some years when it's really rainy. Uh, but this one is actually uh, a series that has the seasons. Although there are only two seasons in the Philippines, we try to group the data in terms of uh, spring, summer, winter, and uh, uh, winter, spring, fall, and summer. I mean, <laughs> I get a little confused now. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. So this is uh, spring, that's summer, that's uh, fall, fall. Uh, actually, this is fall. And then spring again, summer, fall, winter. And you can see that uh, if you look at the different uh, seasons, when there was an El Nino, I'm sorry, you can see that the El Nino actually started in 2009, and it's actually a strong effect all over the country. And then it continued on to 2010 and 2000 and, uh, and part 
early part of 2010 and later part of that year. And then in 2011, uh, you don't have that kind of uh, dry season that you get uh, in 2009 and 2010. So that's a problem of uh, using yearly averages because you take the average of 2009 and you include part of the El Nino year. And 2010, you have more prevalent months that has uh, uh, representation of El Nino. And then this is uh, the La, La, La Nina cycle. So these are uh, interannual variability uh, in terms of anomalies uh, for the year 2001, 2020. Uh, and uh, actually, you can see the years when uh, the country uh, is suffering throughout years and uh, years when you just get the opposite. Uh, the dry, dry years are the ones in red, and the wet years are the ones in blue. I think I've done that. So when we try to uh, do correlation with El Nino and La Nina, we noted that uh, this is the record from NOAA. There's a weak El Nino in uh, 2004, 6, 14, and 18, moderate one in 2002 and 9, strong in uh, 2015, weak La Nina in 5, 4, 8, 1, 6, and 7, moderate in 2011, strong in 2007 and 12, and neutral during these years. So we compare the oceanic Nino index which shown in red with the actual rainfall rates. And you can see that the index is high when the rainfall rates are low. So that there's correlation here, but the correlation is not consistent. In fact, you can see a low here while it's going up over here. And this manifestation that the impact of uh, El Nino and the rental variability is not due to uh, due to El Nino, but there are other factors. And in fact, uh, you can see this uh, lag over here. So if you do a lag uh, correlation and uh, lag it with one month, uh, we get uh, something like uh, 0.56 in correlation coefficient. That's higher than what we get if there's no lag with only 0.5. And uh, two, two months lag would even improve it. So the correlation with El Nino is not really all that strong. So going back to climate types, Currently, there is uh, uh, Coronas, we call it MCCC. And these are the three climate, uh, four climate types by Coronas that is uh, being maintained by Pagasa. And then there was a study by Bagtasa of the University of the Philippines, IESM. And he came up with this distribution he also invoked uh, four climate types. But then uh, he, he used a much longer uh, time series, actually, than uh, Pagasa. But uh, it's called a prudit deity, but it consists mainly of uh, cages all over the country and in the Philippines. As I indicated earlier, the number of gauges are very limited. So this is uh, a study uh, similar to ours, different time periods, but uh, uh, 
are using the trim data. And that's what they came up with in terms of the distribution of their six climate types. So they invoke six, Bagtasa invoke uh, four, and Pagasa invoke four as well. And you can see that there are similarities in uh, Western Luzon, but similarities over the eastern area of the Visayas. But uh, the extent for the other uh, cloud types is, are, are very different. So comparing the MCCC with our results, our results are in red and uh, MCCC is in blue. And as you see, the seasonality for type one are very similar. It's just that uh, our, our result have higher peak and uh, lower December values. Uh, for cluster two, our results have uh, higher values. Uh, it shows more run in January, but uh, and and February, but basically almost identical for the rest of the year. In uh, cluster three, this is supposed to be the cluster that that are similar. I mean, uniform throughout the year. And uh, as, as, no, this is the other cluster that has some seasonality similar to that of uh, type one. But uh, during the summer season, it has more rain. And during the uh, rainy season, the average rain is a much, much lower than that of uh, type one. So we think that these two are distinct. And uh, type four is actually the type where they're invoking that uh, the, there's no seasonality in rainfall and uh, rain rates are uniform throughout the year. So our results is actually showing more uniform data than the MCCC or the Pagasa data. So I'm showing here a direct comparison. I don't know why I get all this extra. I hope you can still discern the, the different colors. Uh, this is a result. And uh, this is uh, Pagasas, MCCC. So for Luzon, uh, the, this part are almost the same, but, but here, uh, the Pagasa result uh, goes further down. And uh, the, the th cluster type three, Yeah. It's shown to uh, go all the way up to Northern uh, Palawan and uh, 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 what do you call it, Albay. And uh, with Pagasa, it's split between uh, type one and uh, type three. And uh, for type four, we can cover only uh, the southern part, <clears throat> like uh, Negros, Cebu, and Bohol together with much of uh, Mindanao and southern Palawan, whereas with uh, the Agasa, you get uh, a very different characterization of uh, type uh, three. Okay. 
So this is a very important difference, you know, because type type three and uh, type two are uh, very different in terms of uh, char characteristics. One is supposed to be relatively flat and the other one has some seasonality. And then uh, the type four is what you see on the right. This is the area that's prone to type one. And uh, our results shows that it goes from uh, Bicol Peninsula all the way to Northern Mindanao. Whereas uh, with the Pagasa uh, retrieval, it goes all the way uh, to Northern uh, Luzon in, in the Eastern area like that. But as you see the other retrieval like from Bagdasa and uh, uh, Corona, they don't have anything other than uh, type type three in the eastern part of the zone. So what you see at the bottom is actually a representation of uh, the same seasonality, but you you can see better the difference between uh, our our results and and uh, the corona results. And as you see, the type two and uh, type four are very similar in the corona result whereas we, we show that they're very distinct and uh, type four is, is more uh, uniform with the results, which makes it even more realistic. So to gain insight into the difference, I, I show again the climatology. And as you see here, the areas that are uh, very strong in rain during the period of uh, January are, are located over here. And it doesn't extend all the way to Isabella and Cagayan. Whereas uh, the areas that are very strong in rain in Luzon are, are located here in, in Agos and, and just goes all the way to Panay. So I, th I think that uh, our data is more consistent with uh, uh, what is shown by uh, Pagasa uh, and the uh, Corona's result. So there are those who claim that there are only six clusters, uh, there are only four clusters, some claim six clusters, uh, some actually already claimed only three clusters. So uh, a way to evaluate that is to do silhouette analysis. And uh, this is a plot of silhouette coefficient against a uh, number of clusters. And what they recommend is to use seven clusters. Uh, others have used six and others have used four. So what we try to do is to use seven first and then try six to see if, uh, how we must do so have six clusters and then we use four which is the standard that Pagasa has been using and what Bagdasa is also using. So results for uh, cluster analysis using seven uh, came in equals seven resulting in seven clusters and seven climate types. Okay. And uh, as you see, this cluster three and five are similar. And then cluster two and six and seven have also very similar season, seasonality. So if you combine three and five, and then through two, six, and seven, then you end up with uh, four clusters. Uh, 
And, and the reason why we can combine them is the fact that if you do a, a Kormu Gruru Ismirmu test, uh, you, you get uh, the P factor that uh, is consistent with uh, no significant uh, difference when we combine uh, cluster five and cluster uh, three together, and also uh, cluster five and cluster two and cluster seven and cluster two. So these red spaces here are the ones that can be combined. And uh, they're also shown in this cumulative distribution function that's uh, shown here. This is combining two and five. They're almost on top of each other. And this combining two, six, and seven. So just to make it complete, we also did uh, cluster analysis uh, using k-min equals six, and we came up with this seasonality. And again, we find that uh, two and six are similar, and also three and five are similar. So you can reduce the number of cluster to four as well. And, and this is the result. Uh, Actually, this, uh, the seven clusters are indicated in different colors here. And we ended up getting this for four clusters. And the six clusters are shown in separate colors over here. And we ended up with this for four clusters. So this is this practically identical to the one where we invoke uh, k equals uh, four to get uh, four clusters in the very beginning. That's the one that we compared with Pagasa. And uh, just to look at the effect of El Nino and La Nina, we look at uh, the seasonality of uh, the different gases when you only have climatology and only El Nino event and only La Nina event. And it appears that El Nino uh, has an effect in June and July in, in type one, uh, but the, the biggest effect actually occurs in type two. That's when you have a different seasonality for REN uh, that uh, occurs in Eastern Visayas. So from December to April, that's when it's rainy in, in type two, you get the most uh, difference between El Nino and climatology and La Nina. So with uh, type three, you can see that uh, there's more union, more agreement except uh, one month and and uh, type, type four, uh, the disagreement is actually occurring uh, almost the same time as uh, type, type two. So looking at the data during the occurrence before and after El Nino in 2008 and 2010. With the uh, NDBI, you can see that uh, the vegetation is suppressed in 2010, indicating uh, drought areas. Whereas before that, you, you have a uh, lesser amount of uh, uh, effect and especially in the Cagayan Valley, it's actually green here compared to orange over here, which means that there was a lot more rain in Cagayan Valley in 2008 and 2009. So overall in the Philippines, the mean temperature that's inexistent since uh, 
2000 is actually shown here from 1900 to 2000. And as you see, it's mainly negative up to this point where it started going up. And uh, so it's heating up in the last uh, few decades, whereas with precipitation, it's normally a little high until we reach this point when uh, it start uh, getting uh, lesser than normal. So the, the, this is a long-term uh, data and there are only very few data uh, recorded at the time. Much of this data is probably from Manila Observatory. So this one is based on more on synoptic station data from 1951 to 2010. And you can see the same trend in uh, temperature. Actually, from this analysis, trend analysis, you get uh, about uh, 0.01 percent per year. And uh, for 100 years, it means uh, one degree centigrade per 100 years, which is just consistent with what we get from globally from uh, temperatures around the world. So these are SST in the areas around around the Philippines. This is Philippine area. This is uh, South China Sea. And this is Philippine Sea. So as you see here, the trend is 0 0.02 degrees centigrade per, per decade. And uh, it's much lower than that for uh, overall because uh, the SST doesn't change that much uh, with time. And, and therefore, what you see is just uh, a trend that is uh, much lower. And uh, that's uh, our record of precipitation, not much changing. And in fact, over here is a little enhanced. Uh, this is seasonality in precipitation over central Luzon. So that's January, February, March, April, May, June. And then when you get to July, that's only that's really when you get a lot of uh, rain in uh, the western part of Luzon. These are temperatures also in central Luzon. And you can see that there are time periods when uh, distribution of temperature is uh, much more enhanced than other periods. And this is wind data from NSEP. And as you see, the direction of the wind is not very consistent. In April 2007, is what you see uh, a lot of uh, uh, the arrows moving uh, to the south and then goes parallel. But in 2008, practically all of them are going to the south. And this is 2009, that uh, shows uh, a, a, a different distribution. Thank God. <clears throat> okay. So if you look at the temperatures, uh, most of what you see, a surface air temperature, uh, surface temperature is reflected by uh, the near surface air temperature, and uh, this is uh, the the t temperature trend over the different uh, elevations in the atmosphere. So you have a, the the trends for the troposphere at different elevation and then trends in the stratosphere. And actually what you see here is uh, increases in temperature 
uh, if you're near the ground and then it stabilized like that and then started decreasing. So uh, the question is why is the stratospheric uh, uh, region cooling instead of warming as well? And the reason for that is actually the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse in the troposphere, they trap all the long wave radiation and then send it back to the surface. And um, the back and forth uh, makes the, the surface air go up, but then the stratospheric area is deprived of that long wave radiation and therefore it's going down. So in the Arctic, actually the temperature is amplified, but it's not uniformly amplified. And in fact, most of the amplification is in the central Arctic, um, the uh, Hudson Bay area, Bering Sea area. Uh, but in Bering Sea, you can see some opposite trend. But if you look, uh, do an analysis, the trend in the Arctic compared to uh, global trend. The global trend is what you see as a block distribution here, but the trend in the Arctic is what you see here. And the trend in the Arctic is uh, actually three times uh, faster than that of uh, global trend. And uh, that is a manifestation of what they call ice albedo feedback. As you uh, shrink the ice, there's more liquid water that readily absorb heat from the sun. Whereas if there's uh, sea ice, most of that uh, heat from the sun is reflected back to the atmosphere. So there's also uh, regional variability as indicated here with the trend being highest in the Greenland area. So uh, as indicated earlier, one of the key studies that uh, we did is to look at long-term uh, changes in the sea ice cover. And uh, in winter, the ice cover in the Arctic gets very thick. Uh, it averages uh, more than three meters. And in the summer, the ice doesn't melt completely. There's normally about 8 million square kilometers of ice that's left in the summer. But since we started monitoring, uh, the ice extent in the, the Arctic, the minima has been going down drastically. And in fact, you, you see here, 8 million square kilometers, but by the time you get here, it's only four or, or less than four million. So this has been uh, published in the literature. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we also look at the, the winter ice cover where we are able to extract the extent of multi-year ice, which is ice that survives at least uh, two summers. And we get even a, a trend that is sharper than that of uh, the summer ice. So this, how it evolved, this how it looked like early on, and this how it looks like now, so you have other evidence of uh, climate change, glaciers in Alaska used to look like that. And then uh, in recent years, most of that glacier is gone and has retreated to this point. So the surface of Greenland is normally very cold because it's at very high altitude more than uh, three kilometers in altitude. So it's normally mainly gray at the surface, 
but in recent years, uh, a lot of that is is uh, getting melted at the surface, uh, especially in 2002 and 2012. So there's a problem with that. If, if you hit, uh, melt the surface, most of the wa uh, free water that go down uh, percolate to the bottom, and they can serve as a lubricant for the ash sheet, which is very massive. So if the velocity of that ice sheet starts move, uh, increasing to the point where a lot of icebergs are, are moved to the open ocean, then you have a sea level rise. And if you think about it, the whole of Greenland has a sea level equivalence of uh, seven meters. So melting even just Greenland would really uh, wipe out most of the coastal areas around the world. This is also what's happening in Antarctica. And Antarctica uh, is divided into East Antarctica and West Antarctica. East Antarctica is so cold, it will take a long, long time before you can get to melt temperatures. But West Antarctica has a temperature of around minus six during the summer. So with slight uh, global warming, then it can get to melt temperature. And the uh, West Antarctica has a sea level equivalence of uh, actually six, six meters. So a combination of East Antarctica and Greenland can really cause devastation in coastal areas around the world. So we can monitor the sea level using uh, Topex Poseidon uh, data, radar altimeter data. The latest piece is JSON uh, 3. And uh, the record shows that uh, Western Pacific is actually one of the most vulnerable areas. And uh, what you see in red here is the average chance in uh, sea level. And Manila is, is the one, uh, the data over here. And if you do a, an analysis of this data, the trend is actually more than three times that of global average. So this, this area can be vulnerable. Near our home in Chesapeake Bay, there used to be an island that houses 400 uh, uh, that uh, where there existed uh, 400 houses. But in 2016, there was only one lab and the one lab looks like this. So that's the effect of uh, uh, sea level rise. And in the Philippines, we have a lot of islands. This is actually uh, 300, uh, I mean, 100 island in Pangasinan. And uh, the country is ranked as number 10 with the largest population in coastal regions. So, 20% of it, uh, of the population actually lives in uh, the, the coastal areas. So we also worry about uh, super typhoon and Haiyan or Yolanda that occurred in 2003 is actually the strongest ever recorded by satellite. More than 6,000 died. The estimated damage is almost 3 billion. And uh, what we found out through our study is that the SST in the Pacific Ocean warm pool was the highest ever before the occurrence of Haiyan. This was published in this uh, web, uh, journal. So what you see here 
are actually the data that indicates that <coughs> shortly before high end, that temperature <coughs> was the highest ever. And we know for sure that uh, uh, elevated <coughs> sea surface temperature actually causes enhanced uh, uh, intensity and strength of uh, typhoons. They have also demonstrated that in uh, the Katrina uh, typhoon. Excuse me. So we have had flooding associated with Ondoy. Uh, it was quite devastating. Much Manila was underwater. And the water actually went all the way to Pangasinan because this area has uh, low, low elevation. So there has been uh, reports that uh, the number of uh, frequency of flooded events has been increasing. And this is data up to 2003. And opposite to that is drought. Drought can have a uh, devastating effect on agriculture. And uh, modeling studies assume that uh, it will be increasing in in area coverage with time. Uh, this is comparing data on the top with uh, modeling studies. And uh, we have gone from 0.15% uh, uh, to actually 25% in recent years. So there's also fire that's increasing and also associated with the lack of rain. And uh, there's a lot of uh, fire in California in recent years. And that's uh, what you get from the fire in uh, Indonesia that has actually caused a lot of problems, not just in Indonesia, but in neighboring countries because of all the smoke that uh, are transported from the country. <clears throat> so these are statistics about the frequency of fire and the intensity over the years. So in terms of reforestation and afforestation, uh, we have the Amazon in Brazil, which is actually the most important forest cover that's left. And uh, countries in the world have been trying to convince Brazil uh, to help preserve the Amazon. But a lot of politicians there also say that uh, uh, countries have devastated their forests so they can have a means to produce and and produce food through agriculture and uh, uh, a lot of that is going on in Brazil as well. So <clears throat> Indonesian forests have been uh, practically reduced to very small fraction. So they've been imposing a moratorium and uh, there's a positive uh, sign with the Philippines in the fact that they have uh, a national greening program uh, where this, uh, are, uh, they plan to uh, plant uh, billions of seedlings. So we did a study about uh, forest loss and forest gain uh, using Landsat images uh, is actually published over here. I don't know why we, I cannot. <clears throat> and and uh, 
over the time period, there was this greening program. It was going down like that. But after 2016, it recovered again. So we have to find a way in which uh, we get disciplined enough to uh, continue uh, what happens to be a very positive project and, and make sure that uh, the seeds that are planted uh, really survive. And in the process, uh, they get to uh, do the service that they're supposed to provide. So I was part of uh, the IPCC 2014 project as a coordinating lead author. This is the time period when we finally finished the report and the report was reviewed by governments all over the world. So it took us more than what was expected to uh, get agreement from all countries, but we finally was able to uh, publish it. Uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, there's warming uh, since the start of uh, Industrial Revolution, and uh, if you compare records from different uh, laboratories around the world, they're all consistent. And this are, is the trend in terms of global warming. And as you see, it's not uniform. The trend is high in the Arctic region, Greenland, and some other places. But there are also these blue areas where the trend is the opposite. So, what you see here is the fact that if you look at surface temperature and compare that with solar component, the solar component does, doesn't show any trend. So it cannot be solar that's causing the increase. The, the volcanic activity is shown here and there's no trend. So it cannot be the culprit. And then these are the sum of all the oscillatory variability and there the trend is uh, basically zero. So to understand greenhouse uh, effect, you have to know the impact of the different greenhouse gases. So we have CO2, we have methane, uh, low carbon, uh, nitrate, etc., and you can see the impact of of these greenhouse gases. But uh, when you get to aerosol, it can have both positive and negative impact, and uh, clouds can also have negative impact. But overall, the total anthropogenic forcing is shown over here. It increased from 1980 to 2011 tremendously. So the models are not perfect. If you compare, compare different models, they don't come up with the same results. But the procedure is normally like this. You have model inputs, uh, parametrization, and then uh, evaluation. but in, in the meantime, they use uh, validation using surface properties, uh, satellite data, they do diagnostic, and they do regional evaluation across multiple variables. So when I was a coordinating lead author, what we use was uh, what they call CMIPS uh, 5. It's actually a combination of different uh, models. Uh, and the result is that uh, if uh, there are pathways to improve improving the situation, uh, they have what they call representative concentration pathway. 
2.6 would be keeping the CO2 from further increasing. We just keep it at uh, 421. And 8.5 will be doing nothing and then just let it to, to increase as as present. So if, if we do 2.6, then we can stabilize the temperature. Otherwise, it will increase tremendously. Also, we can save the sea ice cover. It will go down like, otherwise it will go down like that and we lose it. We lose the summer ice altogether by this time period. And then we we can also save uh, the ocean from being too acidic and, and it stabilized at, at this point other than going down. So these are two scenarios. The temperature would be like this compared to that. Precipitation would be like this, which looks more normal other than having extreme drought and extreme uh, uh, rain. The sea ice would be preserved as opposed to losing it altogether. And then the salinity, I mean, the pH of the ocean will be more normal and we could prevent ocean acidification. So with uh, <clears throat> the new IPCC report, the more stringent requirement uh, with the previous one, we allow an increase of uh, two Kelvin, but now they they want one point five. Uh, they have SSPI, where they require uh, where the increase would be one point nine, so we want to go lower than that. And then there's two point six, with same as before. For the increase is almost uh, two Kelvin, and then when you get to eight point five, the global increase would be about four point five. So, <clears throat> I guess it's four forty four. Uh, I'm I'm gonna skip much of this. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the the requirements for COP twenty six, COP twenty seven. They're all stated here, and I think the main culprit is China and India. Uh, U.S. and Europe used to be the culprit. Uh, but as you see, uh, the emission from China is more than half being em that emitted by U.S. And, and, and Europe right now, and India is moving very, very fast. So we have means to monitor emissions from different countries. And when we had COVID, actually, uh, the nitrate was like that in the East Coast, but during COVID, it was just like that. So that can be one of the mitigations, the fact that we, if we try not, not to use energy too much, then uh, we, we know that we can reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. So these are mitigation strategies and this is my conclusion. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that <clears throat> the strongest climate signals are coming from the polar regions, but those most affected are likely those in the tropics like the Philippines. And uh, then uh, what the Philippines has to do is uh, actually to be able to adapt and have a good risk strategies. 
So <clears throat> that concludes my talk. I'm sorry, I went to, uh, I went uh, over time. <laughs> and I'm open to so questions right now. Nako, sir, kahit po um, napahaba po yung inyong topic and talk, eh, napaka-interesting po. Maraming sir, maraming pa, uh, salamat po sa pagpaunlak po sa amin ngayong hapon. At sa uh, mga members po, academician, panelists, and attendees, huwag po kayong magsawa. Next week po, meron naman po tayo isang napakagandang topic. At sir, komiso, sana po uh, huwag po kayong magsawa kung sakali man po na kayo ay amin pong imbitahan muli sa mga next episode pa po. At tigyan po kami ng isang napaka-insight po at maganda pong topic po muli. So sa atin po nagkapakinig, viernes po ngayon. Let's enjoy the weekend. Maraming salamat. Stay tuned po. Next week po, same time, same place, same channel. Everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you.